orgulloso, orgulloso. Ferrol is an isolated port on the Galician coast in northwest Spain. It was here that Francisco Franco, who would become El Caudillo and the longest lived of Europe's 20th century dictators, was born in 1892. In commemoration of that great event, the city was made to bear the name El Ferrol de Caudillo from 1938 to 1982. Cadijo was the title Franco gave himself. It means leader or strongman. Disputes over street names and place names which celebrate the dictator still go on, getting on for half a century after his death. Churchill called Franco a gallant Christian gentleman. H.G. Wells corrected him. A murderous Christian gentleman. From an early age, the future murderer unquestioningly accepted the Christian dogma that he was force-fed at school. Ferrol is also an arsenal, a shipyard and a garrison. He accepted too a garrison's hierarchy as the natural order, martial discipline, martial asceticism and martial mores. Add to those an oppressive, omnipresent religious credulousness which infected all aspects of life. A borderline troubled loner, Franco could watch pious pilgrims from northern Europe disembark here on their way to Santiago de Compostela. Like so much in this religion-contaminated country, the fortress which guards Ferrol's harbour bears the name of a saint. The fortress is holy. It protects the port and it is, in turn, protected by a saint. In this case, St. Philip, who was reprimanded by Jesus at the Last Supper for asking, Lord, show us the Father. The martial and the sacred are bonded together. You don't get one without the other. That indissoluble link would become the defining aesthetic of Franco's official architecture. The city's cathedral is dedicated to St. Julian, patron of ferrymen and circus clowns. <laughs> this church is dedicated to St. Francis. St. James, Santiago, was one of the three apostles who witnessed Christ's transfiguration, which, like lycanthropy, is a common enough form of shape-shifting. This is what St. James witnessed, according to Mark's Gospel. His raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. The writing is sumptuous, dreamy, art rather than dogma. It was through Galicia that St. James brought Christianity to Spain. St. James was assisted in his proselytizing task by the Virgin Mary, who arrived at Muxia on the Galician coast in a boat, which turned to stone. The petrified remnants of that boat have curative and predictive properties. They can treat Lyme's disease, phimosis, infertility, goiters, spots, rheumatism, liver lice and the nails. When St. James returned to Judea, Herod beheaded him. His headless body was taken back to Spain to be buried. As the boat carrying him was about to moor, a knight on horseback fell into the sea. St. James, dead and headless, remember, rescued the rider who emerged covered in scallop shells, hence the inseparability of St. James and the scallop. The horse's fate remains undisclosed. St. James's head is at Douai. It's also at Amiens, 
Arras and Saumur. There are bones and strands of hair at Troyes and Vézelay. His entire body is in Toulouse. It's also in Angers and Locurec. There are a few places which are bereft of morsels of this man. He was posthumously generous with his phosphates. Santiago, St. James, was, in Franco's frail grasp of history and sounder grasp of myth, the saviour whose Christianity was the glue that had held together the disparate people of the Iberian Peninsula. Franco restored him to the position of patron saint of Spain, a position from which he had been blasphemously sacked by the secular republic. He, El Caudillo, was the inheritor of Santiago. He was spiritual and actual, myth and blood. He would reunify Spain. Galicians would be as much Spanish as they were Galician, and Extremadurans and Murthians. The resistant Basques and Catalans would be reunified by aerial diplomacy. Franco was, throughout his life, ostentatiously short, dictator short. Only Kim Jong-il was shorter. He was also ostentatiously pious. The latter suggests massive idiocy, which was certainly not the case, or massive hypocrisy, which was. He despised his father, a sometimes violent, generally feckless philanderer, and yes, he revered his mother, the very picture of piety. Ah, oh, the adored mother, the sainted mother, alone of all her sex, the epitome of immaculacy. Had it not been for her duty before God to give birth to little Paquito, she might have been a nun. She might have been the virgin. We've been here before. At some point when he was alive, or perhaps dead, who knows, James again encountered the miracle mother whilst he was praying on the banks of the Ebro at Cesar Augusta, which would become Zaragoza. This time, she was held aloft on a jasper pillar by angels, hence the name of Zaragoza's basilica, El Pilar. She set a precedent for attention-seeking ascetics such as Simon Stydites, who lived for 37 years on top of a pillar near Aleppo and became the subject of Louis Bunuel's film Simon of the Desert. Bunuel, the most devout, most observant, most gleefully blasphemous of atheists, was seven years younger than Franco and a warped mirror to him. His landowning family was rich, worldly, and liberal. His attitude towards Christian obfuscation and superstition was the very contrary of Franco's. Bunuel was the greatest Spanish artist of his century. He believed that mortadella must be made by the blind. He shows what good comes from a hostile education if you resist it, criticize it, and vomit during mass rather than meekly accept it in the way that Franco did. Nothing should be meekly accepted. Bunuel thought that Picasso's Guernica was meretricious. He thought it ought to be burnt. Much of his relentlessly anti-clerical art was devoted to mocking the church's rights, to demolishing its dogma and supernaturalism, to ridiculing its beliefs, to exposing its hypocrisy, to lambasting politicians who upheld its doctrines. Much of his relentlessly anti-clerical life, however, was devoted to amiable conversation with priests in a spirit of mutual tolerance. The church was his making. Its pomp and superstitions 
gave him a fecund subject. It suckered him, it fascinated him, it repulsed him, it fed his skepticism and contempt for obedience, for the bullying military mentality. The Jesuit dictum, give me the child for his first seven years and I will give you the man, is a coarse boast. Bunuel, and James Joyce for that matter, perversely make the case for faith schools, but only for the sentient, who will be so offended by the drivel that they are dished up, that they will mutiny and rebel against the brainwashers and become atheists in perpetuity. The insentient, meanwhile, will join the army or the priesthood or some other line of business where your life is mapped out before you. Eight centuries after his last known appearance, James rose from his grave, well, his graves, reunited his head with his body parts, you need to think of film in reverse, and put in a guest appearance on a white charger at the Battle of Clavijo in La Rioja. He personally killed 5,000 Muslims, so getting the name Matamoros, Moor Slayer. This was during the Reconquista, which gradually rid the Iberian Peninsula of Islam. Here's Franco beneath St. James's white charger. His ideal of his country was based in the past. That was where Spain's future lay, in an evocation of his native God-fearing Galicia, in an evocation, too, of God-fearing Castile, Ur Spain, arid and unforgiving. Where, from the age of 14, he had spent three years in the military academy in the Alcazar at Toledo, uh, familiar from El Greco in his Thomas Hart Benton mode. A building which was evidently fixed in Franco's memory. He was burdened with Christian myths, Celtic myths. The link between the holy and the martial was total. Which part of the past in particular was Franco keen to evoke? That'll be the preposterous past, when God's majesty was unchallenged, when his bellicose will was done by Christian soldiers, when buildings, both sacred and secular, were ornamentally frugal, ascetic, harsh, militaristic, and big. Tyrants build big, absolutists build bigger, fascists build biggest. They identify, whatever that means, with warriors of the past. Franco had the hots for El Cid, as well as St. James. Franco's representational architecture, which was intended to symbolize the state and its leader, who was a gift from God to the Spanish people, was founded in the knowledge that many of those people were cowed by superstition, were gullible, were easily led. Franco was blessed with low cunning. He knew his people. Erinenzo, 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 Erinenzo. The place with the most insistent claim on St. James's body is the Galician city of Santiago de Compostela where lights in the perpetual fog led some shepherds, it's always shepherds, to a bush beneath which was concealed a marble chest filled with bones, which prompted the 9th century King Alfonso II to decree that a basilica should be built to house them. Franco appears to have had no taste for the Baroque, a failing he shared with Hitler and Mussolini. What must have appealed to him then about Santiago was the submission of pilgrims to mumbo-jumbo and to po-face theatricality, piety in the face of nonsense. 
the city's defining industry would become the propagation and maintenance of superstition. It honors St. James's memory. The relics found here are the most genuine, most authentic, most, well, most Jamesian. And no, of course, there is no DNA to attest to the bone's provenance. Both God and St. James are realities in the mind of believers. Were they not realities, no one would make the pilgrimage to Santiago, a place whose sanctity is exceeded only by Rome and Jerusalem. This was the destination of the pilgrims whom the young Franco had watched disembark at Ferrol. They walked 70 miles from the port to here. Compared with the majority of the routes to the sacred city, this was unpunishing, hardly likely to mortify the flesh, vilification in the honor of God. The sweat, the flayed flesh, the thirst, the sheer rigor required, the mental toughness, and beyond that epic struggle with oneself, there were hostile exterior hazards. The sun, the rushing rivers, the freezing nights, the crumbling bridges, the slopes and thorns, the scars, attacks by wolves, attacks by bears, attacks by eagles, attacks by human animals, the presage of a terrible posthumous fate, swindling hotel keepers, the thieves and footpads, the con men, the pardoners, the indulgences sales teams, the specialist flagellants equipped to supply extra pain. If only. <laughs> the arduous pilgrimage, the actual getting there, was paramount. It was evidently open-air masochism. It was exhibitionistic. It was meant to hurt. It made exceptional demands on the body. The head of Franco's National Youth League said that the pilgrimage was Spanish, thus fascist. It was fascist, thus Spanish. And St. James was very fascist. Of course, hair-shirted godliness is not peculiarly Catholic. It is ecumenical. It recurs throughout the history of delusions. The earliest recorded pilgrim in the year 899 was a bishop, Godelskak. His diocese was Le puy en velay in the southern Auvergne. The city is a topographical and geological prodigy. In such places, exceptionalism fomented religious faith in an age of scientific ignorance. The great rocks were supposed to be goddesses descended to earth. The bishop's example was followed over the next 400 years. Roots were established. And all along them, in southwest France and northern Spain, there grew up dozens of rip off towns and mercantile villages, such as Conque, Estella. Santo Domingo de la Calzada. The settlements were competitive with each other. Each had its own gamut of miracles. At Osebrario, bread was turned into bleeding flesh. At Santo Domingo, roast chickens came back to life. Roast doves flew out of an oven. Divine punishments were meted out by God, a vengeful old bastard who'd forgotten to take his medication. People come back to life after being crushed by masonry. A monk expiates his lubriciousness by castrating himself before God can punish him. A sin of presumption rather than a miracle, surely. Inns, hospitals and sanctuaries were built to profit from pilgrim hordes and to exploit them. It's boasted that in the early Middle Ages, half a million people traveled annually to Santiago. 
the precise figures are, of course, unknowable. We have to have faith in sacred statistics. Pilgrimage was a form of mass hysteria. Pilgrims expected to experience the miraculous, visions, cures. And if you expect to get them, you probably will get them or convince yourself that you have got them. Pilgrims were the first tourists. They laid the foundation for all subsequent tourism. Today's tourists expect something different from home, something miraculous, something exotic. They may call themselves travelers, but the gulf between tourists and travelers is non-existent, save in terms of social class. The expectation and anticipation remain the same, across ages, across cultures. No one bothers to reflect that travel may narrow the mind, that it may corrupt. Go as a pilgrim, come back as a whore. From the mid-14th century, numbers declined. Bubonic plague, the Black Death, swept through Europe from Central Asia. The reputation of rats has never quite recovered. The plague was God's will. Those who were spared made the pilgrimage as humbly thankful penitents and were infected by fellow pilgrims, by innkeepers, by pardoners, by indulgences sales teams who have been infected by previous customers. Go as a pilgrim, come back as a corpse. The greatest cause of the decline was, however, doctrinal, the Reformation, which began a century and a half after the Black Death. This schism set in motion the fracture of Christian communions. It would lead to a multiplicity of competing denominations and eventually to a Christian-inflected secularism and thence to the Republicans' militant secularism and provocative anti-clericism, which Franco's nationalists eventually annihilated. Martin Luther accused the Pope and the Cardinals of practicing sodomy. He was a bit of a spoil sport. Why else do men become priests? What is the point of striving to attain the rank of bishop, archbishop, cardinal, or even pope if you can't enjoy the perks of someone else's perineum? Luther's ire was aimed, too, at pilgrims and pilgrimages. He castigated pilgrims for their self-congratulation, for performing good works and acts of piety to show off. He abhorred the clergy who dreamt up ever more pilgrimages, created new markets for indulgences and manufactured relics. The clergy was impressively rapacious as well as lubricious. Spain itself was little touched by the Reformation, whose propaganda from the north was spread by print. Possession of smuggled texts, heterodoxy, heresy, and apostasy were punished by the Inquisition's executive fulfillment and specialist remonstrance programs. The Vulgo, the common people, were no more or less illiterate than the people of other European nations, but they were more superstitious and they lived in a society where the boundaries between church and state were so intertwined that they were almost indiscernible. It was pilgrims from outside Spain whose interest waned, pilgrims from what Spain calls the continent, from Europe beyond the Pyrenees, foreign Europe. The road to Santiago went out of fashion, and it remained out of fashion for over 300 years. Then, in 1884, Leo XIII's papal bull decreed that yet more relics found by builders at Santiago were, beyond all possible doubt, those of St. James. By the time of that bull, fewer than 100 pilgrims each year were making their way to Santiago. 
almost all of them Spanish. Pilgrims would pass by the grand ships, the countless fortresses and castles which abound in northern Spain. They're impressively forcible reminders that Christians and Muslims fought a holy war over several hundred years. And they secured their lands, their vanquished lands and their recovered lands with these supposedly impenetrable bastions, which were barracks, refuges and arsenals. Franco appreciated that religions are armed cults. And there are no cults more potent than crusade and jihad, and no causes more holy than the repulsion of jihad and the defeat of crusade. To subscribe to a religion is to commit oneself to its survival, to fight for it, to cleanse, which means to kill, and to sanctify, which means to land grab, murder the kufar, murder the infidel. As a young officer in North Africa, Franco was in a battle which ended with the heads of a dozen Moroccans being brought back to base as trophies. Mission accomplished. Seize the enemy's territory, violate his women, enslave his children, indoctrinate them with the true faith, which is our faith. They're a bad lot, religionists, bad as each other. These castles were hefty signals of how the country had been made, how it had been recovered, how it had been won, how its holy rocks and rivers and soil had been divvied up among God's warriors. They stand as monuments to forms of governance that are pre-democratic, tribal and aristocratic. <laughs> To achieve such a state once again was the aspiration of the putschists of whom Franco was a leader and not yet supreme. The military coup d'etat of July 1936, which triggered the civil war, was intended to rid Spain of a democratically elected republican government which was too red, too liberal, too secular to appeal to uppity army officers and their landed paymasters. The architecture of the Republic had been progressive, a Spanish variant of international modernism, which was to the nationalists too international, too cosmopolitan, too modern, insufficiently Spanish. It looked to the rest of Europe to America and especially to Argentina. It was an architecture made by citizens of the world, not by xenophobes. Nationalists aim to establish a state that was variously rural, insular, Catholic, monarchist, intolerant, vengeful, fascist, pre-Reformation. These were seen as virtues. They yearned for the Middle Ages. The Nationalists called the Civil War the Holy War. They had God on their side that they were victorious was proof of it. The Republicans paid for their anti-clericism. They had banned the Jesuits, they had burnt God's houses, they had murdered priests. They had incurred God's ire, and as the Old Testament persistently reminds us, God is a shit who shares the characteristics of a Sicilian capo. 
God is not a nice guy. Franco's holy triumph was infamously achieved with Italian infantry and German artillery and aircraft, the Spanish Foreign Legion and the Regulares. The Foreign Legion was, in fact, not foreign but mainly Spanish, and the Regulares were not that regular. They were North African mercenaries airlifted into Spain by German troop planes. Many of them belonged to that branch of the Catholic Church called Islam. Money trumps faith. The Legion and the Regulares shot prisoners, gang-raped women, castrated men and placed their genitals in their mouth, an Islamic speciality which would resurface in Algeria 20 years later. That's freedom fighting for you. They had been promised pillage and they got it. Savored it with the indulgent sanction of Franco's Catholic nationalist officers. Pillage was policy. Pillage trumps even money. The brave or foolhardy Christian philosopher Miguel de Unamuno had initially been enthused by the nationalist coup. But he ended his days under house arrest, having publicly humiliated one of Franco's most senior generals. Earlier, he had described the nationalists as Catholic without Christianity. They practice ancient militarized Spanish traditions that are not Christian. He died after suffering a hearthside stroke. Fortunately, he was unconscious when his slippered foot slid down into the fire to meet his God. In the years following Franco's victory, Spain was not at war, while most of the rest of Europe was. It was in a position to construct something other than defensive buildings. Britain was desperately erecting Nissen huts and pillboxes. Germany was designing bunkers and death factories. Spain was agriculturally backward. Millions suffered shortages. Many were homeless. The economy was stagnant. There were strikes and riots. The black market thrived. Rationing continued to 1952. Nonetheless, he embarked on a programme of building. It largely neglected to address the manifold social problems, but that was never the point. The purpose of the programme was to assuage his massive vanity. He was Caudillo. He was Generalissimo. He was Bravissimo. <laughs> It was an ostentatiously backward-looking program of building. It processed into the past. It was a grandiose procession, certainly, but also clod-hopping and coarse. But then a light touch doesn't go with the job of dictator. Franco's mission or vision or destiny or calling, one of those things anyway, was to exhume the omnipotent imperial Spain of the Habsburgs, of Philip II. He wished to be treated as the equal of that king. He aimed to consolidate the position he had attained as a belligerent by recreating this golden age, which unusually and unlike most golden ages, had some claim to actually having existed. He also sought to somehow reincarnate El Cid, whatever that involves. When the dreary film with gun-crazy Charlton Heston in the title role was shot near Valencia, Franco loaned the production several thousand soldiers as extras, which no doubt helped with his metempsychotic ambition. The Escorial was holy as well as regal. It was the work of one Bautista de Toledo, and after his death, 
Juan de Herrera, who was commanded by Philip to make a building that expressed nobility without arrogance, majesty without ostentation. Herrera was also responsible for the Alcazar of Toledo. These two buildings are deemed to be the pinnacle of Spanish architectural achievement. Their obsessive and repetitive sobriety is, weirdly, as dizzying as the freneticism of the Baroque or the Chirurgaresque. And equally weirdly, the chilly rigor feels almost Protestant. They were Castilian, both a little over a day's ride from Madrid. The homogenization, the centralization, the Castilianization of the nation was a paramount domestic policy. Castile stood for Spain. It was the model for the mores of the country. Devoutly pious, austere, harsh climate, harsh temperament. The air ministry in Madrid derives eventually from the Escorial, a strange model for a building with such a purpose. That apart, plagiarism should be skillfully disguised, inventive. This sort of dull, literal copy of a copy of a copy is akin to the incestuous Habsburgs themselves. With each succeeding generation, the debilities and infirmities became more pronounced. Franco's was a strange boastfulness. His massive caprices would take decades to be built and thus to be seen. He was out to impress, but impress who? Under his rule, Spain detached itself from Europe, from the Allies, obviously, also from the Axis powers with whom it had sympathized, depended on and exploited, but kept at arm's length. An arm that had grown longer the closer Gotterdammerung loomed. Franco would never have to repay his debts to Hitler and Mussolini. After their defeat, self-sufficiency, autarky, became Spain's necessary ideology and a lesson in being careful about what you wish for. Spain found itself a friendless, mistrusted outcast, a pariah state whose non-intervention in the Second World War was not enough to absolve it from being something more than just a mere fellow traveller of Nazism and Mussolini's fascism. The Western Bloc didn't bother to mask its distaste for Franco's regime, but the realpolitik and paranoia of the early Cold War demanded that it should not intervene in Spain to depose him or offer any support to his opponents. For without him, Spain might be overtaken by communism, reckoned to be an infinitely greater threat than toothless fascism. Franco's architectural revivalism was of the style of the Escorial, neo herrerianism It was an expression of Spain's boastfully proclaimed isolationism. To look back with overt piety was a sort of patrician snub to the increasingly sidelined phalangists and equally to the Western democracies which were optimistically looking forward to nothing more spiritual than white goods for all, white wall tires, plate glass, electric carving knives, jukeboxes, automatic transmission, steering column gear shifts, television tees maids, bubble cars, gonks motor scooters, ballpoint pens, Coca-Cola and burgers, domestic telephones, lighters shaped like pebbles, brine nylon sheets, turgal skirts. Such a consumer's future was to be held in contempt. Spain's future wasn't like that, yet. The cute greetings card urchin the raggedy ragamuffin is a kitsch derivation from Bartolome Morillo. His paintings were early essays in kiddie porn. 
street Arabs of the 17th century were improbably as cheerful as he represented them. They were more likely famished, diseased, crippled, subject to casual violence, forced into prostitution, raped. Those are the bad old days. But Franco did nothing to improve their lot. Rather, he conjured up the bad new days. He created orphans by the thousand, and he ate them by the score. And he created orphanages, such as this one in Hijon, more like madrasas, really. Indoctrination with lashings, take that how you will, lashings of orthodoxy and obscurantism. The children of murdered Republicans would be brainwashed with mariolatry and hagiology. Their teachers were sadistic brides of Christ and predatory bridegrooms of Christ. Further, in addition to children whose parents were dead, there were children of surviving Republican parents who were stolen in order to be re-educated. What is today the Hijon Technical University was designed by Luis Moya as an orphanage, an inculcatory workhouse for thousands of children. Fascist regimes and the Catholic Church had perverse ideas about the sort of building that was appropriate for orphans. There is an unmistakable correspondence with Armando Brassini's equally megalomaniac orphanage Il Compresso dei Buon Pastore in Rome, built a few years earlier. Some children of Republicans bore revolutionary given names, Passionaria, Luxembourg, October, Germinal, Saint-Just. This heretical nomenclature was quashed. Pope Pius XII, the amnesiac one with a pair of blind eyes towards Nazi atrocities, had a message for Spain on Franco's victory. So many innocent children were taken to faraway lands, often in danger of apostasy and perversion. We desire nothing more ardently than to see them return to the bosom of their families and those others who, as prodigal sons, wish to return to the house of the father we doubt not that they will be welcomed with goodwill and love. This building is the largest in Spain, which gives some indication of the grandiosity of the brainwash project. It's in Galicia, Franco's native Galicia, but it bears no relation to Galician vernacular. It is an emblem of Franco's moral reconquest, his sacralization of everyday life and his Castilianization of everyday life. Holy years are those when the Feast of St. James, July the 25th, falls on a Sunday. The holy year of 1948 was the first in 11 years. In 1948, Santiago de Compostela attracted half a million pilgrims or tourists. They enjoyed such pious diversions as fireworks, football tournaments and bullfights, even though the last weren't and still aren't locally popular. But the Jamboree was not merely a question of devotion to St. James or of penitence, of absolution, of self-denial. St. James and Spain were once again indivisible. Hence, that Holy Week was also a celebration of Spain and Spanishness. And, by the by, it was an earner. It was an opportunity for the pariah state, denied foreign aid, to get its fascistic gauntlets on some democratic coin, francs and kroner, sovs and marks. Money which could be used for, among other projects, the building of El Valle de los Caidos the Valley of the Fallen. Not that the builders were paid. This was the biggest slave labor project in Europe since World War II. The slaves were captured Republicans, political prisoners, 
housed in a concentration camp and worked to death. El trabajo enoblefe, worker nobles, whose translation is Arbeit macht frei. The risible claim is that this exemplary feat of pomposity honours the dead of both sides in the civil war. El Valle de los Caidos is a gargantuan work of kitsch. The fabricators of kitsch don't realise how laughable their work is. Camp is the very opposite. It is knowing. Like many dictators, Franco considered himself an artist. He harassed the architects. It's hypocrisy made stone, a shrine to a merciless absolutist and an insult to everyone else save those diseased nostalgics who still worship him. Esta es una tumba en la que cagarse. This is a tomb to shit on. He deserves the sort of grave that Hitler and Himmler, Bormann and Mussolini, Gaddafi and Bin Laden got. No grave at all, no headstone, no name, no provocation to remember. He could be exhumed and dumped on a tip. Obliterated. Though if the same standard is applied irrespective of date, then it has to be said that the inhuman resources and construction methods of this nation's abundant castles and churches, fortifications and aqueducts, ought also to be reckoned shameful. One difference is that memories of the actual making of those structures dissipate over centuries, over millennia. The structure remains whilst the reckoning, the tally of how many died and the conditions in which they had endured a living death, become largely unknowable, points of contention between advocates of opposing persuasions whose arguments are based in nothing more than wishfulness. Stones endure, but they're no help, they have nothing to say. 42 years after Franco's death, Spain's socialist government famously and riskily made the decision to legislate on crimes committed during and after the Civil War despite a general amnesty having been declared in 1977. That grossly, shamefully biased amnesty created an equivalence between state-sponsored nationalist murderers who were granted immunity and political refugees who were allowed to return to Spain and laughably invited to forget the unforgettable, to sweep 40 years of state crimes under the carpet. Fascism endured in Spain long after it had been elsewhere excised as anything but a putrid fringe grouping. There are many people alive today in Spain who have personal, first-hand and unmediated memories of Franco's regime. Ought collective memory and collective memory loss to be responsive to legislation? Can they be responsive? A well-intentioned, morally justified government instructing its people how to remember a despised former government is obviously going to be accused of aping that former government's dictates. There is governmental resolve, parliamentary determination, but the country is divided. Franco's family is, bizarrely, still powerful and prepared to raise countless legal obstacles. A symptom of Spain's dilemma is that Spanish writers are loath to address it. It remains to English writers to wrestle with the elephant. Paul Preston, Giles Tremlett, Jeremy Tuglone. The dead seem fated to remain willfully untraced. Anywhere you stand in Spain, you may be standing on a grave, a mass grave, a grave dug by its future occupants. Solo un cobarde se niega a cavar su propia tumba. Only a coward refuses to dig his own grave. The thousands of graves which contain thousands of victims are unsigned. They're as unmarked as plague pits. Finding them in this vast country is difficult. Searches 
are based on hearsay, which is itself based on further hearsay, which is based on yet more hearsay. As the pilgrimage to Santiago became ever more popular in the decade after World War II, so did the Parador chain expand in the north of the country. These were hotels uh, based supposedly on North American models, country inns, such as you might find in California, North Carolina and the Catskills. They offered a level of luxury unusual in post-war Europe. Some were in expressly constructed buildings, others were former hospitals, castles and monasteries. Their success caused a trickle to turn to a stream. However, only a minority of pilgrims could afford them. Their clientele tended rather to be what were not yet called culture tourists. The sort of Bidecker people whose holiday reading might have included Madame Dolnois's Memories of the Courts of Spain, George Borrow, Gerald Brennan, and Sir Cheverell Sitwell. His boldly entitled Spain had just appeared. Its first publication was in 1950. Sitwell was enthusiastic about Paradors. The benefits they confer upon the traveller can hardly be exaggerated they've made it possible to see some of the most beautiful scenery and architecture in cleanliness and comfort. The problem for an economically fragile country desperate for foreign revenue was that the number of church snoopers, castle crawlers, collectors of ruins and gastronomic adventurers was limited. The resources, old stones, sublime landscapes, were abundant the eyes to appreciate them weren't. The fashion for Neo Herreriano, Neo Habsburg buildings did not survive. The much bruited isolation did not prevent Spanish architects from acquainting themselves with what was happening in the rest of the world. They were all too aware that the official style was old hat. The revivalist buildings turned out to be a parenthetical interlude, both preceded and followed by modernism. Modernism in different forms, many of which were akin to those of the rest of Europe. Then there was international amnesia about the Civil War and Franco's collaboration with the Axis. This amnesia was encouraged by America's strategic friendship of convenience. Financial assistance in return for land on which to build air bases. The superpowers example was followed. It was not just Spain, but the entirety of impoverished Western Europe, which regarded Eisenhower's complacently paranoid United States as the land of plenty and the land of the future. Never mind the vulgarity. Spain, too, could soon have two-tone everything. Gonks, motor scooters, ballpoint pens, jukeboxes, tease maids and bubble cars. The Spanish state became less ideological. Yes, it still imprisoned its political enemies and thought criminals, and it still executed some by strangulation. But the government was increasingly influenced by the predominantly lay Catholic organization Opus Dei and its so-called technocrats. 
judicious pragmatists, many of them celibate, determined to open Spain to the world. How many members of the government uh, belong to Opus Dei now? There are three ministers in the cabinet, in Franco's cabinet, who are members of Opus Dei. Mr. Lopez Rodal, Mr. Bravo, and Mr. Mortes. Now, it's, it's said that they look after Opus Dei interests in cabinet and in the government. Is that correct? <laughs> no, well, we reject that. that that's a joke. Uh, they, they are Franco's ministers. They are not Opus Dei ministers. In the end, who is Opus Dei responsible to? Well, to the Catholic Church and to God. As simple as that? As simple as that, yes. The work of an early Opus Dei member, the architect Miguel Fisac, was part of that process. Spain was trying to achieve what would be internationally recognized as a sort of normality. By the mid-1950s, fascism was regarded as a freakish abnormality from a past which was to be ignominiously buried along with its victims. Among the liturgical reforms of the Second Vatican Council in 1962 were the introduction of the vernacular mass and, spatially, the stipulation that the congregation should be physically close to the host, which isn't physical, it isn't literal, so the idea is a bit of a non-starter. The deluge of new churches after Vatican II may have had its roots in an architecture which already existed. The greatest architecture does not express the present. It presages the future. It shapes the future. The sanctuary at Aranzazu in the Basque Country is the work of the young Saint Oi and was designed as early as 1948. However, it met with numerous objections, both aesthetic and liturgical, and wasn't consecrated till 1958. Even then, it must have seemed way ahead of the game. Franco's wish to emulate Philip II was partially granted, though not as he'd have wanted. Like that Habsburg monarch, his relationship with the Vatican was often fraught. His natural ally turned out to be nothing of the sort. It was frequently troublesome, imperiously insubordinate, and prone to meddle in temporal affairs. Its new architecture was a very public snub to his traditionalism. Up yours, Cadillo. It constantly reminded Franco of the debt he owed it for its support in the Civil War. He responded with the incontrovertible message that it was his forces which had fought for the church and that his state had ensured Catholicism's privileged hegemony and persecuted its opponents. At the same time, he reminded the Vatican that Spain was a secular state, not a proxy theocracy. He found it difficult to understand the burgeoning liberalism of many of the younger clergy and determined to stamp it out, ingrates. A few older clergy too, among them bishops. He attempted to usurp the regal right to name new bishops, but was outmaneuvered by the Vatican. He countered by imprisoning several dozen priests in a cleric's only jail in Zamora. 
where, no doubt, they could radicalize each other. Other priests, red priests, worker priests, harbingers of liberation theology, were attacked with impunity by far-right gangs. The church, which had been his ally, had become a breeding ground for disquiet. Murmured dissent gave way to outright hostility. Priests would be taken seriously, for they had the ear of the people, thus they were subjected to retribution. Architects and artists, however, were allowed considerable freedom. Spain was gradually abandoning its hermeticism. The troglodyte was venturing from its cave and was inviting people in. The country was readying itself to join what is comically known as the family of nations. Remember, 60% of murders occur within the family. And the various strains of architecture which asserted themselves over an even longer period were pretty much mute. Architecture generally is, it hardly speaks. Its articulacy is limited. Architecture possesses only the most elementary vocabulary. It is stuck for all time in early infancy. It's like clothes, a series of signals, a code without nuances. The code transmitted by the Poblados de Colonización, or new model villages built in the 1950s and 60s, was that they were a balance. They evidently have roots both in the generic modern movement and in some undefined form of regionalism. Since the majority of them were constructed in southern Spain, that regionalism might be extended to include the entire Mediterranean littoral. The showy experiment involved 200 villages, each provided with a church and 13,000 houses, 100,000 jobs, 400 single-sex schools and 3 million hectares of land. They were pragmatic expressions of agricultural renewal, of a one-party state's inbuilt authoritarianism and regulation, and of a controlled experiment in land tenure. Nonetheless, when Franco died, 50% of the land was still in the hands of just 1% of the population, almost as inequitable as Britain, where 1% of the population owns 60% of the land. Labour was organised according to ministerial strictures. Smallholders' rights were largely suppressed. Politically approved teachers and loyal priests were imported. Markets were regulated. Dealing on the black was liable for prosecution. At the same time, colonists were provided with clean homes, services, modern machinery and a transport infrastructure. Agrarian reform would not only bring improved crops and livestock, it would transform still feudal peasants into proper farmers. The chaos of land ownership would be resolved. It would reverse the rural diaspora. Carrot. Colonists were given up to eight hectares and a programme of what they might grow. Stick. The terms of tenure were exacting. Targets had to be met. Were they not met, the colonisers might lose their home. It was all dependent on water, on irrigation, on the possibility of fertility. The more arid a country is, the more backward it is, the more poor it is. The fetishistic importance granted to water is demonstrated by the structures and buildings associated with it, the laboratories where it's studied, where its management and the means of harnessing its power are investigated.
Francisco Franco built more than 500 dams. He liked to preside at their openings, quite ignoring how ecologically disastrous many of them were. His self-esteem swelled, a goiter of patriotic pride. Changing the climate, whether by cloud seeding or diverting rivers, is the mark of a human god, an Aquarian magician who was described as a statesman unique in the world, laying the hydraulic foundations for the well-being and progress of his people. Especially those people who supported him, the grand landowners, the latifundistas, who would be the real beneficiaries of his hydrophilia. He was seen as an obsessive creature of water, a joke amphibian. Paco is a diminutive of Francisco. Rana means frog. Paco Rana may be roughly translated as Frankie Frog. This frog, like any wise Iberian frog, was aware of the disequilibrium in the country's water. There's too much of the stuff in the north and not enough in the south. Surfeit and deficit. With deficit came drought. The most grandiose of the schemes to overcome the natural imbalance was the Tajo Seguro transfer. Water is pumped to a height of 300 metres above the Dam Tajo in the mountains east of Madrid. Canalized, it flows some 300 kilometres south by southeast through a system of reservoirs, dams, tunnels, pumping stations and aqueducts to Murcia, the region of Spain most afflicted by drought. The region, too, which provided Franco with his most merciless killers. Were the two connected? Does literal thirst promote blood thirst? You tell us what you think. It is, anyway, a great feat of hydraulic engineering, whose beneficiaries were, again, latifundistas. And the losers? Inhabitants of villages drowned because they stood in the way of reservoirs. Many of the interventions were also ecologically disastrous. In the age-old battle between environment and profit, here posing as the common good and agrarian reform, it was, of course, profit which won. The bottom line is the most potent of ideals. The lavishly entitled latifundistas may have kept their head down during the Republic, but with the water warrior Franco favouring them, they could revert to type. The latifundistas may have considered El Caudillo to be what the British Army calls a gopwo, grossly over-promoted warrant officer, and anything but an aristocrat. But they would never have dared say so. And besides, he loved hunting, so might well have approved of this caste's invention of a new sport, which it jocularly named agrarian reform. It consisted of hunting on horseback with packs of dogs. The quarry was peasants, rural reds, bucolic bolshies, people who didn't have a ladder to be on the bottom rung of and whose body would be dumped in the usual pits. Franco himself preferred more conventional quarry, pheasant, partridge, pigeon, plovers, woodcock, quail, grouse, squab, snipe, mallard, teal, pintail, boar, hare, rabbits, deer, sheep, ponies. His behavior was often that of an indolent figurehead rather than a hands-on tyrant. There were hunting accidents. He shot himself in the hand on Christmas Eve, 1961. And a couple of years later, the minister Manuel Fraga shot Franco's daughter Nanuka in the buttocks. Franco was otherwise preoccupied during the 1936 Berlin Olympics, but the prestige that a regime can gain from sport did not escape him. 
In the two immediately post-war Olympics, London 1948 and Helsinki 1952, Spain had triumphantly accumulated a single medal, a silver in men's pistol. A curious fact that we learned from Paul Preston's great biography of Franco is that he was a football fan who did the pools. I'll repeat that. Franco did the football pools, which is not what one expects of a dictator. But then these fascists move in mysterious ways, and so, of course, does God. The greatest of all footballers, Johan Cruyff, a militant atheist, said that a match in Spain begins with 22 players running onto the pitch, crossing themselves. He observed that if this superstitious appeal to God actually worked, then every match would end in a draw. Eibar zero, Real Madrid zero, Sevilla zero, Valencia zero, Getafe zero, Levante zero, Español zero, Real Sociedad zero, Atlético de Madrid zero, Celta de Vigo zero. Cruyff scored known goal. There is a god. The inadequacies of the Spanish national team were apparent in a 6-1 defeat by Brazil in the 1950 World Cup and in its inability to even qualify for the 1954 tournament. But there were club teams. Rather, there was a club team, Real Madrid. Real, of course, the only club in Europe who played in every European Cup competition. Won it five times, but beaten finalist once. Franco promoted Real. His agents crudely threatened its opponents, especially FC Barcelona, the symbol of aspirantly secessionist Catalonia. His people did deals on its behalf. Matches were routinely rigged. He thought of it as his team, as his thrilling gift to the most international of games. Puskas himself to Hendo, and it's a goal! A lovely goal! Though the stadium built in the late 1940s is Ur Spanish, its original design, which would be widely copied, had derived from the bull ring. But the players were as Spanish as Ferenc Puskas, who left Hungary after the 1956 revolt and joined Real 18 months later. They were as Spanish as Alfredo de Stefano, who was so enthusiastically nationalist that he had played for his native Argentina and for Colombia before he played for Spain. So the all-conquering club, which won the first five editions of the European Cup and became a herald of the newly emerging Spain, the centralised Castilian Spain was about as Spanish as, say, El Cid's burial place, Burgos Cathedral, which might have been airlifted from the Rhine or the Moselle. Ah, Hento. Real Madrid's players were, and still are, known as the Meringues because of their all-white clobber, the colour of St James's charger. Uh, nothing to do with them being as much mercenaries as Franco's troops two decades earlier. When Sergio Ramos takes off his shirt so that we can appreciate his cartoonish body, we should perhaps think of other bodies, the skeletons in the pits. All murderers are punished unless they murder in large numbers to the sound of trumpets, Voltaire. Franco, the devout Catholic murderer, contributed vastly to football's becoming a new religion. The most revered players are saints. Pilgrimage sites, churches, castles, ruins and football. Those were the attractions that Spain had to offer tourists. The Madrileño ideal in high summer was to holiday in the temperate, indeed often cool, north, away from the heat of the capital. 
the Mediterranean coast was not yet developed for tourism. Mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. Spaniards don't. The prototype of the industrialized holiday resort where inmates or guests are processed as standardized units was devised by the risibly named, cruelly named Kraft durch Freude, strength through joy. Prora, a planned Nazi holiday resort located on the island of Rügen, north of Stralsund, was not a propitious start for a new sort of settlement. Pedro Zaragoza was an energetic Franquist placeman, born in the small, economically straightened fishing port of Benidorm between Valencia and Alicante. He was sent back there from Madrid to be its mayor at the age of 28. His vision for the development of Benidorm as a tourist mecca was explicitly endorsed by Franco. Paragossa became one of the most successful urbanists in the world, not least because he had probably never heard of the pseudoscience of urbanism and had shown no interest in theories that fell off the back of a lorry loaded with pretension. He turned an off-the-map village into an enterprise which soon overcame the handicap of its Nazi provenance, if anyone was in the mood to look. Render unto Caesar the things which be Caesar's, and unto God the things which be God's. Together with Jesus' retort to Pilate that, my kingdom is not of this world, this may be read as a way of emphasizing that the temporal state and the sacred church are separate. So while God-botherers may have indignantly objected to displays of flesh, to displays of public drunkenness, to displays of mob loutishness by Ingerland Landland's finest, their opinion counted for little. Police were instructed to turn a blind eye, which given what they'd have had to look at was probably what they wanted anyway. What happened to Benidorm and subsequently to places like Torremolinos, Tosa del Mar, and countless towns and countless villages along the countless costas, Blanca, Brava, Dorada, Sol, self-evidently happened within Spain. But it was hardly Spanish. It was Hispanic Britannic. The very names of the coasts were the inventions of British package tour companies and airlines. It was also Hispanic German, Hispanic Dutch, Hispanic Skander, carefully tended isolationism ceded to coarse cosmopolitanism. The dirigism of dictatorship evaporated into a hardly regulated capitalism. Piety and totalitarian order were overthrown by the pursuit of elemental pleasure, by foreigners who had no idea where they were. We come by aeroplane. Ideology was dumped on by the market. Foreign sewage was dumped in the Mediterranean. The ghost of the dictatorship's martial order was discernible in the regimentation of package tourists. Adults, obedient as children, waited in line, weighed down by sombreros, caramelized brandy, hangovers and bullfight posters every one of them an ambassador for his or her country in a kind of mutant service economy, in a hybrid, partially imported environment. It became a sort of de facto colony. Colonizers bring their own culture with them, their own mores, their own immutable tastes, which are routinely held up for derision. But so what? Institutionalized silliness is hardly harmful. And if precious sensibilities are offended by the tradition of Benny Hill, Max Miller and Donald McGill, by Blackpool, Yarmouth and Skegness, well, get a grip. No one ever went to Benidorm for spiritual solace or intellectual enlightenment or moral improvement. 
send a donkey on holiday and he doesn't come back as a horse. <coughs> Benidorm provokes the desire, but it takes away the performance. The set, the foreground, the backdrop, the physical surrounds are hardly noticed, such as the excitement. The physical actuality of the place where these pursuits are played out is ignored and unseen. Why? Benidorm is a marvellously strange anomaly. It resists all sophistication. It's an affront to cool. It's a poke in the eye for minimalism. This is what Prolet Cult ought to have been, by the artless people, for the artless people, without the guiding intercession of the cultured bourgeoisie with its patronising worker worship. The British food is, of course, horrible. Fish and chips, full English breakfast, the horrors of baked beans and sausages. But the maximalist buildings, uh, they're seldom considered architecture, are often thrilling. They have the potency of cheap music. If architecture is frozen music, this is the Roubettes. It is deprecated on the usual grounds, the hierarchy of use. A hotel's or an apartment block's or nightclub's use, its purpose is apparently less noble, less distinguished than that of a church or seminary or school. Architectural worth ought never to be determined by moral criteria, but it so often is. What if the nightclub owner gets God and transforms his building into a place of worship? Does that give it a chance of redemption? The order discernible in package parties is not to be found in the apparent chaos of the city. Sprawl, which suffers a poor reputation among the conventionally bien pensant, usually signifies the horizontal. This combination of sprawl and verticality is unusual. The skyscrapers here are so compacted that they steal each other's light. The wind takes you unawares, it comes from all directions. The city possesses the power over climate Franco coveted but couldn't achieve. It possesses too the fortuitous collisions of style, shape and scale that only laxity, greed and an unselfconscious lack of good taste can achieve. Bad taste is vigorous, just the ticket. Benidorm is a prodigy of architectural mongrelism and ad hoc urbanism. Franco's placement, Zaragoza, inadvertently created a new kind of city. Benidorm and its siblings are the visible part of the dictator's legacy. All politicians seek a legacy. That they do so is a mark of their infantile vanity. But of course, this mix of high-rise bling and low-level hedonism is not the most telling bequest that he made to the country that he had stolen and then for so long tyrannized. It's just a trinket. This gallant Christian gentleman's terrible gift to posterity is only partially visible. Much of the gift has yet to be unwrapped, to be exhumed. Memory of the carnage of 80 years ago may be unspoken, but it's far from being erased. The butchered bodies and unmarked graves are his true monument, which citizens of the world ought not to forget because you never know where and in what guise Apollyon may next appear. <laughs>